Chapter 9, Enzymes. This gets a little confusing. I think enzymes is a little difficult for us to understand. So hopefully I'll get rid of all the questions. We have enzymatic reactions occurring in our body. So we make a lot of enzymes. But we also use the same characteristic that enzymes have in our testing. Just like we said with our immunoassays, sometimes we're measuring the antibody, but sometimes we're measuring something else that's the antigen, okay? So keep that in mind as we go through this process. The enzymatic controlled reaction is called kinetics. And we will be doing a kinetic procedure in lab next week. And seeing it will kind of help make it a little clear. Enzymes have a job where they catalyze rea reactions with substrates. The substrate is anything that is going to react with it, basically. But we call it a substrate. So we have an element, a reactant, a substrate, add an enzyme, and we end up with a product. That sounds pretty simple, okay? And they are named after the substrate or the element that they're acting upon, and they all end in A's, A-S-E. We just did, in lab, hexokinase reaction, okay? We were measuring what? Hexo... And the glucose? Hexose? A's. So we added an enzyme to cause the reaction to attach to the substrate was the glucose or the hexose, okay? And hence, here's one you're familiar with. We we'll also can do urease where we, we are measuring the urea or the uricase. We're measuring uric acid, but we use this principle sometimes to measure the enzymes that we're making or sometimes to measure the substrate that we're making. In your textbook on page 205, they are classified, I think there's six different classes based on how they work. The most simplest one is the transferases. They're transferring something, okay? So you don't need to actually know all those names just remember that it's based on how they're acting, what category they're going to be placed in. They have three main properties. Their, their actual function is to supply the energy needed for vital functions. The enzymes that we have within us are supplying energy. They're not a carbohydrate, okay? they are supplying the energy. Glucose broke down and made energy. Enzymes are a little different. They're supplying the energy needed for a reaction to occur. They speed up how fast this reaction occurs so that we can have almost instantaneous reactions in our body. Some of these reactions, if they did not have an enzyme to help them along, that could take days to occur. Well, our body can't wait that long. You know, we, um, just like with the glucose, we can't wait for days before it's going to kick in. We need it to start being produced or broken down, whatever it needs to do right away. So speeding it up without compromising the product. Remember we had the substrate plus an enzyme makes a product. So we don't want to change the product. They are not used up. Okay? They're not changed and they're not consumed. And that's a hard concept, I think, to understand. It's causing this reaction. You know, what happens to it? Nothing. 
And we only need a small amount of it because it's recycled over and over and over. So it's like it, it's, think of it as kind of a transportation. It gets hold of a substrate, changes that substrate, and then lets go of it. And the substrate goes and does, the product goes and does whatever it needs to do. Then it comes right back and gets another one, changes it, and lets it go. So it's used over and over. E is recycled. It's not changed. It's not consumed. So we don't need very much of it. When we have some injuries on some tissues, we end up making a whole bunch of it due to that injury. And that's where we can use an enzyme to help determine a certain injury location. Okay, and the other half of this lecture is talking about specific enzymes, where they're made, how they can help us when they get elevated. It's an injury to a certain organ. And this little video will help you. Short and sweet. to work. There we go. And a few terms you need to know about enzymes. Remember the, ter the prefix APO back in our uh, lipids? It's a protein portion of this compound. Coenzyme sometimes is like a, <coughs> excuse me, a second portion of the enzyme that in enhances what we need it to do. And when you put those two together, you get a hollow enzyme. This is your active, catalytic active unit. We can change or influence the enzyme reacting, and this is more so outside uh, on the bench when we're using enzymes to help measure a substrate. If we change the temperature, if we change the pH, although they worked best, actually 7.4 is where they work best because that's what our hum human uh, pH is. But, you know, we got a little window there. And we can add cofactors or coenzymes that will help speed up or increase the reaction occurring. But there are sometimes some inhibitors involved that actually decrease it. And so that creates more of a problem for us that we have to be aware of, that we might not be able to do this reaction because there's an inhibitor that is keeping the enzyme from doing its job well. And that also happens in the body, and we can also use inhibitors purposely with medication to give you, to work on not having so much enzymatic reactions. The most common cofactor, and we've actually seen this, if you pulled the package insert for the hexokinase procedure, we talked about NAD, okay, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, NAD. Nobody knows what it stands for. Okay, so if you know those terms, you're pretty good. With or without an extra hydrogen. Also, we've also taken it a little further and I don't think, yes. With or without phosphorus. So with phosphorus, it has a P. So you might see NAD or NADP going to NADH or NADPH. So if you look on the package insert of the hexokinase, NAD is involved there. And so we use, use that in our chemical reactions in the lab to enhance the enzyme that we're trying to measure. And because it, NAD absorbs light, and in, excuse me, NADH absorbs lights, when it's reduced, to NAD, it doesn't. So we can see a change in absorbance, one way or the other. Whichever one we happen to give it, when it gains that hydrogen, then you're going to see a difference in the absorbance. 
So we use that characteristic. Add NAD or NADH to our chemical that in our reagent to help enhance, speed it along, make it work better so that we can measure. Some inhibitors that you, uh, categories I guess you might want to know. They can inhibit by competitive binding. So this picture, this little video, the port, so to speak, something else will fit in there nicely. So it's a competitive, just like we talked about with the antigen antibody. We label one, and it fights for the same spot. They're the same uh, structure. But sometimes they're not competing for it, okay? And they bind to someplace else and kind of changes the shape of the enzyme. So then, excuse me, what you want to be bound can't because it changed shape. Or this one, it's binding to the enzyme and substrate combined, so it can't make a product. So it's just changing how the enzyme can work, inhibiting it some fashion. Let's see if this, I think this is a short one. Okay, we're talking about energy. Remember I said the purpose of it was to provide energy for this to happen? That's what the enzyme is to do. Energy of activation, and this is in your textbook. This is a formula, so to speak, trying to show you what's happening. 9-2, so we have an enzyme plus a substrate. They bind together, and then they separate to make the product, and the enzyme is now ch unchanged back to its original just like the little demographics that we were watching, okay? But we talk about energy of activation. It's the amount of energy that is needed to take one mole of your substrate and make your complex, okay? It's the amount of energy needed. And this gets a little complicated. Just know the name, Michelson Minton, some scientists that came up with this theory that um, Vmax is the velocity, the speed, okay? Substrate concentration is high enough that all the enzyme molecules are bound. That's when they're saying all active sites are engaged. We've got to have a surplus of substrates. Just think about it when you're cooking. You have two liquids that you've put together. If you wait long enough, they eventually will mix. But sometimes that takes a long, 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 long time. Put a spoon in, an enzyme, and stir. The enzyme's not changing, but it is allowing those compounds to bind. So that's that's a real simplification of how we're trying to explain what they're doing. And we have done studies and know what the Vmax is. How much do we need? And I've got a curve here and it's in your textbook. We're concerned at half Vmax. That's halfway there. And that is able to come up with a constant, a number that we use in reactions. If we control all of the things that are happening, their temperature, our pH, so on, then they've established a constant that we can use to help us come up with the amount of the enzyme or the substrate, okay? This this graph is in your textbook, and this is showing you. This is how much energy it's going to take to change this substrate to make our product without an enzyme. If we have an enzyme, we only need that much energy. That's half the Vmax, okay? And now it gets complicated. When we did our colorimetric tests and even the hexokinase that um, we were running on our specs, 
we had two knowns. Blank was zero, zero, and then our standard, in the case of total protein, 8.0 grams. And we had a nice straight line, okay? And the company said, we are linear to, do you remember, 15.0. After 15.0 grams, we don't know what happens, but it changes, and for the most part, they go up and they drop off. So we're only stay, say, stating that it's linear up to 15. Basically, we don't apply these terminologies to colorimetric spectral photometry, but think of it to help you understand. That is the first order of kinetics. It's a nice linear reaction. Now, we're not talking about absorbance now. We're talking about the rate of the reaction. So a lot of our paperwork, our procedures, will talk about rate. It's the velocity of the reaction, the rate of the reaction, not absorbance now. This is a different kind of reaction occurring. The first order of kinetics is the first part. It is directly proportional to the substrate concentration. And that makes sense to us because it's the same kind of principle as the colorimetric. Color was proportional to concentration. Now we're talking about rate of reaction is proportional. We can't see this, okay? The more substrate, the higher the velocity, the higher that line goes. But up to a certain point, it's not gonna stay linear it's going to start plateauing and be horizontal, okay? A lot of enzymes that we measure in the laboratory, this is where we're going to be. It's not linear, it's constant, and it's called zero order of kinetics. Quiet. <laughs> we have a plateau. So the rate is now not dependent on the concentration. It's independent of the concentration. It is dependent on the enzyme. Don't get too lost. So, what we can say is, as all the enzyme gets used up, the rate is stopping or slowing down, so to speak. So I don't have this continual climb. My enzyme's getting used up. Okay. We must have a great, great excess of substrate so this can work. Okay. So when we are do, measuring enzymes in the laboratory, we're going to add a whole bunch of substrate. Lots, it's up to 100 times the amount of our expected enzyme we're trying to measure. And when our enzyme is so, so, so high because of some injury that's happened in the body, it can't continue the reaction because all the enzymes getting bound up because there was not enough substrate for it to make the product let go, make more product and let go. There's not enough of it. So we have to dilute. So when you get to, and we can't, I don't ha have the testing methodology in here to, to uh, teach you this. When you get to clinicals on enzymes, when they get really high, you get some really funky answers and there'll be a proper dilution protocol. And often you start with a times 10 or times 20 dilution. Because when we have an injury in an organ, it makes massive amounts of this enzyme. And so we've got to dilute it way down so that we have a lot more substrate than we do enzyme, okay? But there's a few tests you can't do that because of those uh, inhibitors we were talking about. If you dilute those down, then it doesn't work properly. So you're always going to have to know which of these tests may I dilute and I cannot. So when you cannot make a dilution, 
All you can tell them is it's greater than that upper limit. In the case of our um, glucose, it, it's not. We can dilute the glucose. But if that were one of these uh, reactions that you could not dilute, you would have to say glucose greater than 500. You couldn't tell them, is it 1,000 or is it 501? You can just say greater than 500. And a lot of the enzymes that we do, that's what we say. And really, it doesn't matter. When you get so high, it doesn't matter if it's uh, 9,000 or 25,000. It's that high, it doesn't matter. Okay. But sometimes you can dilute it down, and you'll probably start with a times 10 or a times 20, and that's a big dilution. Keep that in mind. Okay, this is in your textbook, and this is showing you the first order of kinetics. We have this nice straight line, and we're mostly concerned with this area, okay? But eventually, it starts plateauing out and becomes zero order of kinetics. So you want to add these notes. First order of kinetics, we have low substrate. The rate of the reaction is proportional to the amount of the substrate, concentration. Okay? When we have high substrate, then that's when we've reached this plateau, and the rate is dependent on the enzyme amount. We measure enzymes in international units. We've done protein and glucose. They were in grams per deciliter or milligrams per deciliter. Enzymes we measure in international units. And what is that? <laughs> okay. And that goes back to the amount of energy that's going to be used to produce one micromole of your product in a minute. So almost universally, everybody uses international units for enzymes measurement. So I'm not getting a little very fast here. So what we know about enzymes, they are proteins. They catalyze these reactions. And in order to increase, oops, sorry. In order to increase a rate of reaction, they help to lower the amount of energy needed. So they help our body. Um, and the way they work is mostly muscle or organ contraction. Think about that, okay? They make this product so that our organs can work. However, when some of these organs or tissues are damaged, then our body will kick in and make a lot of the enzyme that we normally wouldn't. And that's where we can utilize the elevation of specific enzymes to help narrow where the injury might be. Okay? They are usually uh, immediate release and short-lived. They go back to their normal level within a very short period of time. So it makes some good markers. And now we're going to talk about a few specific markers. There are several in your textbook. Some of these have gone by the wayside. I, I will just allude to them. Not that I expect you to know a lot of them, but a few of them you need to know pretty well. The first one is creatinine kinase, CK. Okay, CK is made up of two components. It's called a, a two-dimer. It's got um, B, which the, if the two parts are Bs, it comes from your brain. So if you had a massive head injury, you're going to make a lot of the B portion. The other portion comes from muscle. Well, you know, 
I could just press on you. You've got some muscle injury. You can go to the gym and exercise. You're going to have muscles releasing this enzyme because they're working in excess. So just the M portion <coughs> is not that helpful because we have muscle all over us, whereas, you know, the B, the brain, is one organ. But when you have the portion of M and B, it's predominantly in your heart muscle. So we found that if we could take a total CK and break it up into its fractions, the MM, the MB, and the BB, and measure just the MB portion of it, we could determine if you've had a cardiac event. So if we first just measure total CK. Then we started doing electrophoresis, and that was very time consuming, so you had a heart attack, and you won't know till tomorrow when the day shift people come in and do this very time consuming testing. So over time, we were able to, using our immunoassay methodology, we can measure just that MB fraction. And these were um, labeled one, two, and three. So if you get an order for a CKMB or a CK2, we're just measuring that one portion, the MB portion of the total CK, because we're not interested in MM. Every now and then, a physician might be interested in the BB, and that's, you, I mean, you know, when you've got brain injury, they can usually see it, because <laughs> your head's all smashed in. Um, and belong, along with all of the functions that you can't perform. So it's not that useful, but they might want to monitor to see if it's coming down. So I want you to look at the reference intervals. This is the total, international units. Males have quite a bit more. Why? Take a guess. I'm sorry? Yeah, they're bigger in general. Okay, and that also would uh, relate to the MB, and it's usually a, a percent of it that we're measuring, or we're going to give them. But all of this can affect your total CK, which is mostly your MM portion. And so you don't want to go to the gym right before you get your physical, <laughs> okay, because it's going to be elevated, and then they're going to call you back in to do further testing. Um, and as you can see, just a short rest will bring it back to normal. Okay. Um, think about, oh, in box 91, I want to see if yours is the same as mine, because they categorized the MB incorrectly. Let's see if they fixed it in your book. Under the second category, it is not a CK3. It is, oh, they did fix it. Okay. Mine has a two. Everybody got threes for skeletal muscle in your textbook? Then you want to cross that out. Because it should be, it should be the three. It's MM, muscle, skeletal muscle. That's, that's everything that's holding us up. LD, we used to measure a lot and did the electrophoresis and broke it up, but we're not doing it so much anymore. Just wanted to bring that out. It's got four parts, okay? It's a tetramer. And... Um, one and two come from the heart and red cells. So if it was hemolyzed, it's going to elevate it. Whereas the um, other end is more from muscle. So we use this to help determine if we had a heart event, a cardiac event. But we don't anymore because we we just don't. We moved on. But you know, there just might be something out there. Just be aware of it. Okay. Remember I said they're categorized by what they do. These are amino transferases. They're going to transfer an, something with aminos. Aminos are proteins. Okay. 
and there's two main ones that we, well, there's three, but there's, these two are on here, okay? Aspartate and alanine. AST, look at where it is. It's in the heart, the liver, muscle, kidney. So if I have an elevated AST, you know, I got four major organ systems going on there. That's not going to tell me a lot. So we don't use AST very much anymore. But it's still part of your comprehensive panels. Look at ALT. It is almost all liver. So we consider ALT to be liver specific. So if we have a liver issue going on, you're going to see an elevation in it, okay? And you need to note, oops, sorry, keep pushing the button. You're going to see the greatest elevation with viral or chemically induced hepatitis. The liver's damaged. Sometimes your liver's having problems, but it's kind of secondary. It's an obstructive liver disease, and that's what OLD stands for. In the case of tumors, cancers, or even cirrhosis, and so it won't go as high. It's still functioning, but it's not going to be nearly as high as when you have hepatitis. So we can kind of use how high is it to help us distinguish a little bit here between what's going on with the liver. Alkaline phosphatase is also in the liver, but it's also in your bone. Okay, we're going to see it most significant in that OLD, obstructive liver disease. So I would expect to see a, a really high alkaline phos and a high ALT, but not real high. But what's there with the liver? You've got your bile duct, so you're going to might have some biliary problems. But also, if you've got something going on with your bone. Now, this has to do with bone replacement. If you're breaking down bone and replacing it, alkaline phos is going to be elevated. So when you are an adolescent, your bones are constantly rebuilding or building. So adolescents have an elevated alkaline phos. And all of these enzymes are age-related. But I want you to know in osteoporosis, osteoporosis, do you all know what that is? That's, that's me. I get really hunkered down and get shorter than ever. And they have this big hump back here, humpbacks. And it happens into small framed women in their older ages. The bones are naturally breaking down and they're not replacing themselves. So there is no alkaline phos activity, okay? Because it has to do with repair and it's not repairing. So in osteoporosis, even though we say this is bone related, alkaline phos is not part of it. It's not going to be elevated in non rebuilding of your bone. <clears throat> the other uh, transferase is GGT. It is very liver specific, okay? And depending on how elevated it goes, it can help us break down what might be going on in hepatocellular diseases. It's only moderately elevated. So uh, we can help use this between liver disease and bone disease. So usually you have a group of enzymes you'd measure together and kind of, uh, it's really a matter of elimination. You know, they all might be liver, but one of them might have another organ system. So if you do multiple enzymes, levels and only parts of them are elevated, 
the, and almost all of them are related to liver when you're talking about the transferases, then you can eliminate, is this coming from the liver or not? Amylase, got another ASE, okay. And we talked about this with the carbs. We have amylase in our mouth, in our salivary glands. It starts breaking down those carbs and proteins, anything that we ingest, starts breaking it down. But there's another one down in the pancreas. So we have two types of amylase, actually we have more than that, but two that we're mainly concerned. And they work, they're different. So obviously if you're looking at a pancreatic problem, you're not going to be testing saliva, are you? Or vice versa. And it has to do with changing our carbs. Even though part of it's in the pancreas, that's still what it's going to be working on. So if you have acute pancreatitis, and we do know what acute means. Somebody give me a quick word. Sudden, rapid, suddenly got sick, as opposed to chronic. What's chronic mean? Okay, it might have progressed slowly and gotten worse over time, okay? but it's like it never gets better. Acute can become chronic, but chronic doesn't become acute. So just, that's with any condition, okay? Just keep those two words in the back of your mind because that will help you determine some conditions going on. In this case, for amylase, I'm looking at acute pancreatitis. It's going to rise almost right away within five or eight hours of whatever's happened. And within three or four days, it's going to be back to normal. It is going to give me extremely high levels if I have acute pancreatitis. So somebody has a major, major attack, and it's usually, you know, in this area, and they're hurting, and they're really, really stubborn like me, and I'm not going to the doctor to tell me that my stomach hurts, and... They stay home for four days, and then finally they get in the emergency room. Well, it's already coming down, so they've already missed that window of opportunity. And this happens with a lot of our enzymes. Um, you will see it elevated in obstructive liver disease. Appendicitis, that's not related to the liver. So we use this to help us diagnose appendicitis. And there is this condition be aware of it. Macroamylasia, it is a false elevation. They really don't know why. Can't really pinpoint a problem. Okay. And alcoholism. Anytime you've got an alcoholic involved, anything with your GI system, liver, pancreas, and such, is going to be affected. Okay, they're going to damage the organs past repair. But the most significant one, acute pancreatitis is going to give you the, the highest levels. And remember it, AMLAs for appendicitis, because that's one of the most common things we see presenting in the ER. Lipase kind of works with amylase. It comes from the pancreas. And you remember your uh, glycerol ester back yes, last week? Triglyceride. Amylase works on trigs. If somebody has something's usually going on, but they have a high consumption of fat, and we see this a lot in our animals, our dogs in particular. You may have had a, a dog. I had a dog who, who had uh, pancreatitis, and they said it was from, had, had a problem going on, but he had a one-time event of a high-fat ingestion, 
and it triggered the lipase in the pancreas and it was sky high. Okay, it was trying to break up all that excess trig. So it gave permanent damage to the pancreas so that you had to put them on a, a low or no fat diet. I did not give him anything, okay? <laughs> he probably ate a raccoon or something in the yard. My neighbor's dog just had that, and then he died. A pancreatitis is, is, um, can be life-threatening. But usually you have this one attack, and they figure out what it is, and then you just behave yourself with your diet if, if you recover from the first time. Okay, lipase is also with acute pancreatitis, but it's more specific than amylase for the pancreas, okay? It also rises in about that same time period as the amylase, but it stays longer, okay? So if they wait four days to come in, the amylase will be back probably to normal, but your lipase will still be up. So we can help us to distinguish or if they came in at onset, this would be more specific for the liver, I'm sorry, the pancreas, than the amylase was. Chronic pancreatitis, they're going to have elevation all the time along with alcoholism. Or if you have some kind of obstruction. But this is the main difference. Because it's more specific for the pancreas, with those appendicitis ruptures, it's not going to elevate, okay? So if a patient presents to ER with severe abdominal pain, usually on the right side, they do an amylase lipase. And what would you expect this to be as far as elevation if you have an appendicitis? Amylase out the roof, lipase might be elevated, but not significantly. Good as opposed if I had acute pancreatitis, it's switch. Um, and this chart kind of help you put the perspective of the enzymes, where they come from, and when they're significant. And just be aware, like alkaline FOS can not be specific, and sometimes we can use them together use them with something else. So like if I had an elevated alkaline FOS, but my GGT was not elevated, where are you going to think it came from? Bone. Okay. If I had uh, an elevated CK2 or an MB, but not I don't even see, oh, an AST, where do you think it came from? cardiac, CKMB. And that's how they often call it. MB or CKMB is the newer term where we're just measuring that middle fraction. Some places do still call it CK2, but most of them have been calling it MBs. And sometimes, you know, like if you've got your GGT, your AST, your ALT, your alkaline FOS, what do you think? Everybody's up. Liver, okay? So you might have a liver panel and it has all of these enzymes on it. So if one of them is down, then it's kind of like, well, if alkaline FOS isn't elevated, but this one is, then, I, then um, I think bone, like you just told me, okay?